In this episode, I want to talk about a behavioral pattern. It's one that I've witnessed in people who tend to climb to the very top of their career ladders. And I've noticed that the ones who don't do it also tend to stall out right around the middle. And it's about connecting people who are in very different worlds and playing the role of a bridge. This is Invincible Career, and I'm Larry Cornett. I was standing at a whiteboard in a large conference room with Prabhakar Raghavan. And this was probably, oh, 12 years ago uh, on the Yahoo campus. And if you're not familiar with who he is, he's currently a senior vice president at Google. He's responsible for Google search, which you may have heard of. Uh, assistant, geo, ads, commerce, and payments products. Well, however, when I was working with him, he was the chief scientist who was running Yahoo Labs and one of the smartest people I'd ever met. At that time, I was the head of consumer products for search, and I was spending more time with the media and the board than ever before. So I was lucky enough to spend some time learning from him because he spent a lot of time presenting to people and talking with the board. You know, this is an excerpt from his Google research page to give you a sense. Prabhakar is one of the foremost authorities on search. He's the co-author of two widely used graduate texts on algorithms and on search. Uh, Randomized Algorithms and Introduction to Information Retrieval. He has over 20 years of research spanning algorithms, web search, and databases, published over 100 papers in various fields, and holds 20 issued patents. So yeah, he's a smart guy. We were preparing for a board meeting, and I was also going to be meeting with a new member of the board to talk about our latest strategy for Yahoo Search. And his biggest advice for me, keep it simple. Really really simple. And then he quickly sketched a really bare bones wireframe of the search page, the search results page. It was on the whiteboard. It had basic blocks to identify algorithmic search results and the sponsored results, which is, you know, essentially the advertising. Really simple. And actually, you know, keep it simple doesn't really capture the essence of what he meant. He described how critical it was to avoid technical jargon, insider vernacular, and anything that would confuse the listener. We lived in the Silicon Valley corporate world. We spent our days discussing search technology, day in and day out. The board members did not. Their world was very different than ours. To earn a seat, In the board meeting and a chance to present to them, you had to be a bridge between the complexity of our technical world and their business and operational world. You had to explain things so they could easily understand what we were doing and why it mattered. It was critical to bridge the gap between our expertise and their domain experience so they could provide valuable insights, they could give us relevant feedback. And all of it would help us make better decisions. If you could not explain things in a way that they could understand, or if you made someone feel stupid, you'd never be back in that room again. It would be a career limiting move. The board loved Prabhakar. Tech journalists loved him too. He was smart eloquent, and he had a knack for cutting right to the heart of the matter with simple explanations that made people feel like they were walking away with a better understanding than they had before. Whenever I think of someone who could be the bridge between two worlds, I remember Prabhakar. If you look at his career journey, you can see that this ability is one of the things that helped him rise to the top. Um, I shared a link to an article. It's uh, in newsletter.invinciblecareer.com. This is Be a Bridge to Climb the Ladder, issue 297. 
And so the title of the article, I think there's just, I think this came out last year or yeah, late last year. And it says Prabhakar Raghavan isn't CEO of Google. He just runs the place. He runs search ads, commerce, maps, payments, Google assistant, all the businesses that bring the lion's share of the company's revenue. And he's paid like a CEO. Last year, the company paid him $55 million in salary and stock. So he's doing okay. (laughs) On the flip side, I can also think of people who stalled out in their careers. They climbed the ladder to a fairly senior point in their profession, but couldn't quite break through to the highest leadership levels or executive levels. Now, I know that some people just aren't interested in that. You're not interested in the management track. I get it. But some of these individuals, the people I'm thinking about who stalled out, they also weren't able to get promoted to the most senior individual contributor levels either. And when that happens, your earning potential stagnates. That has a huge impact on your lifetime earnings. That's because excellence in your craft, in what you do for your profession, will only take you so far. Yeah, doing your job well is definitely necessary to climb the early rungs of your career ladder. I mean, if you're not great at what you do, you won't progress very far at all. You're not going to go anywhere. However, even the most talented individual contributors hit a ceiling if they cannot communicate well with others. To climb to the highest levels, you have to communicate with people who don't live in your world. Sadly, too many people think that it makes them look smart to toss around big words and baffle people with the complexity of their craft, show off their intelligence, and try to prove how important they are. But it doesn't work. In fact, the more someone refuses even to try to bridge a communication gap, the more they reveal their low emotional intelligence. If you are interested in breaking through this career ladder ceiling, you should learn how to bridge the domain expertise gap between you and the people you work with in other organizations, other companies, customers, you name it. The most successful people that I've watched over the course of my 20-some year career are those who do this exceedingly well. But how do you do it? How do you become a bridge? Well, here are some steps that you can take to learn how to do this well. And the first is really to understand their world. You know, who you're going to be communicating with. Who do you have to work with? It begins with curiosity and empathy. Take the time to research someone, figure out who they are, what they do, what you think they're trying to accomplish. Care enough to put yourself in their shoes. What's their world like? What matters to them? How might they be feeling? You know, how are they feeling coming into this meeting? What do you think they want? What do you know about them? And when you talk with someone, show that you understand who they are and what they do. Do your best to connect your world to theirs. Ask questions. Ask a lot of questions to learn more about them. And I've shared an article about that, wow, maybe a few months ago. But it was about good questions to ask when you meet someone. And this is all about trying to understand where they're coming from. And then the next thing is to learn enough. Learn enough. You know, I, if you know my background, I started out as a designer many, many years ago. And over the years, I moved up into management. So I was managing and leading teams. And I used to tell young designers 
to learn enough to be dangerous. I was referring to learning enough about the technology to communicate well with engineers. Learning enough about product metrics to have better meetings with product managers. And learning enough about business goals to know how design could help achieve them. But it's not really about being dangerous. You just want to learn enough to have intelligent conversations with other people instead of living in your own world. Learn enough about someone else's job, their domain. What, is, what domain do they work in? What are their goals so that you can start to bridge these gaps? You know, bridging the gap between what they want and what you can provide. Bridging the gap between what you need and what is possible. And that's often the case when designers, for example, are talking with engineers. Bridging the gap between how they describe their world and how you talk about yours. So it's all about learning enough. I'm not expecting anyone to become a multi-domain expert so that you know everything about design and engineering and sales and marketing. <laughs> it's too hard, but you can learn enough to have a great conversation. And then you want to be relevant. Think about how you contribute to higher level goals, not your goals. I'm talking about the overall goals of the company, the organization, your team even. Too many people get caught up in their private world and forget where they fit into the big picture. They miss the forest for the trees. I saw this problem all too often in design organizations. People falling in love with their design work. And design for design's sake isn't relevant in a company that must satisfy customers and remain profitable. And when you're not seen as relevant and you clearly don't understand the larger goals, you don't move up the ladder. Designers aren't the only guilty parties, of course. I've worked with engineers, for example, who would get caught up in the beauty of the architecture and the purity of their code. They constantly tried to refactor and reduce technical debt while pushing out work that would help the product advance and make the business more money. Unless you're an independent artist, your work serves a higher purpose when you agree to be an employee. Be aware of what type of company employs you and make yourself relevant to its goals. And there was a conversation about this recently online. This was, this was coming from a bunch of designers and design leaders. And they were saying that, yeah, if you work at a company like Apple, maybe design is the goal. I mean, design is a differentiator for Apple. They want stuff to be elegant and beautiful and well-designed. So, you know, your goal of creating beautiful design work probably is pretty well aligned with what Apple's goal is. But if you work at a different type of company where it's about efficiency or interoperability or something else, design is a means to an end. And so you have to understand how the work you're doing makes yourself relevant to the goals of the company. How does your design work, for example, make the company more successful when they're trying to sell a product to the, the customers? So be aware of, of who you work for and what their goals are and how what you do serves that higher purpose. And I'm not saying that you need to be a puppet dancing at the end of leadership strings. It's not about doing that. It's not about sacrificing yourself entirely. But you do need to strike a balance between what you want to be doing and what they need. That's why you're getting paid. Be relevant and valuable if you want to keep climbing the ladder. And then... Don't be rigid. This is another thing that's important if you want to play the role of a bridge. 
People are too precious about their profession. At work, we used to call that an ivory tower issue. And it's a bit related to the previous point of being relevant. People with this very impractical attitude, they often act as if they're better than everyone else in other organizations. They can't be bothered. (laughs) It's like, hey, the work we're doing is so innovative and so important to the future that everything else you're doing is ridiculous. And they, they weren't interested in mundane matters of other people. They didn't want to be bothered or the urgent problems the company was facing. They just didn't care. And that may seem extreme, but I, I know people like this. I worked in companies that had organizations like this. They were very separate from the rest of the company and didn't think that the rest of the company mattered what was going on. So guess how that worked out for them? I mean, they enjoyed their little ivory towers for a few years. It's all fun and games. But it all came crashing down later. Most C-level executives and boards have very little patience for spending money on teams that never deliver tangible results for the company. I mean, it has to pay off in some way, eventually. It's different for different companies. I know IBM loves cutting-edge research, and they pride themselves on patents. So, yeah, some of the the folks doing cutting-edge science and research are generating tons of patents, and the company loves that. But not every company thinks that way. Of course, you should be proud of what you do. I'm not saying don't be proud and don't care about the work that you're doing. You should be strong and confident enough to push for excellence, excellence in your craft. Nobody wants to do mediocre work in their profession just to please a leadership team. That's horrible. But don't be so inflexible that you think it's more important to win battles while losing the war. In the end, if the company fails, you lose your job. And all of your hard work fades away anyway. I watched that happen at a few of my past employers. We've all seen it happen across various industries. The quest for perfection, instead of thinking about time to market and thinking about being the right solution for customers, people failed. The purest and most perfect solutions don't always win. Matter of fact, they rarely win. We've seen that happen in many industries. So it's important to be flexible. And then finally, you have to communicate clearly. I mean, that's what it all comes down to. You got to know who you're talking to. You have to understand them. You have to learn enough about their world to be able to have smart conversations. You have to be relevant to what the company needs and what they need. you got to be flexible, but you have to bring it all together and become a great communicator. And I know some people don't want to hear that, but I don't know of any way to skip this step. I mean, if you don't care about climbing to the very top of your career ladder, then don't worry about it. But if you want to expand your influence, you want to be well-known, you want to be well-respected, People have to know that you exist. You can't hide in your office behind your laptop and just focus on your work. They have to know that you exist. You have to communicate. And when you do, they have to understand what you do, what you're trying to say. You must be able to communicate clearly with people who don't live in your world. Some of us have found it's pretty easy to talk with our peers in our same profession or our same department. Designers talking to designers, engineers talking to engineers. But that changes when you start to move up the ladder. You're no longer just communicating with the people on your team. And that changes early. 
You're working with other people to get stuff done. And it starts with being a valuable translation layer between your team and others. I look back on my career and I can attribute much of the success that I had in investing in my public speaking skills. I learned enough to communicate well with engineers and that started way back at Apple. Communicating with scientists, product managers, executives. I told a story in one of my past podcast episodes and newsletters about someone who caught me in the hallway after a meeting and said, you don't talk like a designer. Who are you? And it was because I took the time to learn about their world. I understood the technology. I was talking about technology issues, functionality, capabilities. I wasn't talking about the design because what we were discussing, it was much more important to figure out what was possible. So I learned that being that translation layer between my team and these other teams made me valuable. So you have to drop the vernacular. It's so annoying to talk with someone who speaks in acronyms, uses obscure phrases that only mean something to them and their team acts like they're a member of some secret society. You know, I'm sure you've encountered these people. It's not impressive. It's irritating. And it's going to hold you back. And too many people use complexity to mask insecurity. They spout big words and the unique language of their profession to feel smart and special. I mean, just stop it. It doesn't, it doesn't work. When someone is a great communicator who can make things clear and understandable, people naturally want to spend more time with them. They get invited to increasingly important meetings. They are the ones who get promoted to higher levels of leadership and influence. I'm watching this right now. I'm watching this happen with some of my clients and some of the members of my career accelerator. They've worked hard to be a bridge between their world, their profession, and everything else that needs that's going on around them in the company. What the other teams are doing, learning how to talk with the executives and the language they care about, about the issues they care about. One individual just joined a company, I think, not even 90 days ago. (laughs) It was like, this is the first 90 days. Maybe he's listening. Congrats again, guy. Um, He's so good at this, he got promoted. This is an off-cycle promotion. Shouldn't have happened. In his first 90 days in a new job, he got promoted. That's incredible. And it's because he's a great communicator. He knows how to speak the language that people care about, how to make people understand things. Part of that comes from his past. He used to be an educator. He was a teacher. You know who has to be a bridge between worlds? Teachers. (laughs) All the time. They have to take complex subjects and make them understandable for students. They have to explain it in a way that they care. They want them to understand. They're not trying to baffle the students with complexity. So it really, it comes down to being a bridge. If you want to climb the ladder, be a bridge. And hey, if you don't care about being promoted, if you don't want to climb to these upper levels of your professional career ladder, then you can ignore this. You don't have to care about it. Just keep focusing on your craft. Be happy where you are. It really is okay. Some people don't want the stress. They don't want that imposter syndrome that kicks in as you keep moving up and up and up the ladder. I get it. It's very stressful. Your job changes completely. The stakes get higher. It's a very different role. And some people don't want that. Because when it's the role of an individual contributor, you can focus more on your craft. 
an engineer can become an even better engineer. Designers become great designers. As you move up into these higher levels, you start to give some of that up. It becomes much more about this, communication, relationship management, solving problems, a little bit of politics. And for some people, they don't want it, and it's okay. You don't have to. However, if you are interested in pursuing leadership, and you do want to have greater influence, you must learn how to bridge the gaps between people. Be able to simply connect your world to the worlds of others. And the best bridges, the people who are the most amazing bridges, can even help other people in completely different worlds understand each other. And I've watched that. I've watched people who are in a completely different profession talk with two other individuals that were in very different professions and understand where the disconnect was and be able to know enough about both of their worlds, which was completely separate from this person's world, but to know enough that they could say, no, what, what they're actually asking you is if this is possible and what she wants is this. And they're like, oh, why didn't, why didn't you say that? <laughs> And these people can see those patterns and they can, they can help mediate these conversations. It is awe-inspiring to watch. So if you have any thoughts on this topic or if you have your own advice to share or you just want to tell me how wrong I am, I'd like to hear it. <laughs> With a podcast, you don't get the two-way feedback, right? You hear me, but I don't hear you. But I'd like to hear from you. So you can go to newsletter.invinciblecareer.com. This is Be a Bridge to Climb the Ladder, issue 297. And you can leave a comment. We can have a conversation about this. I think it'd be interesting. I would love to do that because I like communication. Um, good luck with this. I think this is a path to greater things in your career. And I think it's possible for everyone if they're interested and it's what they want to pursue. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you would like to follow upcoming releases of the show, please subscribe. And as always, I appreciate your ratings and reviews. Thank you. If you would like to learn more about Invincible Career and the podcast, you can visit InvincibleCareer.com. Until next time, I wish you the best of luck in becoming an opportunity magnet for the best things in life.